a sustainable thing. Just, just to give you a bit of an idea of what happened and, and uh, I guess a better visual look at what happened at that time, we had, from 1st of December to the end of January, we had domestic, uh, the international market, so soft red winter wheat prices increased by close to $70. And at the same time, this is in delivered Chicago, and the same time, delivered Melbourne, almost on the boat, we had domestic prices fall $23, and it was, it was almost a $110, uh, it was a $110 uh, negative basis level, which is unsustainable. We felt that something had to give. It was either that the, if the international market continued to rally or, or even remained firm, and there was less growth selling, that... that um, we, we would have to increase price relative to, to that international market. Just to give you an idea, the Chicago futures market represents a, a, protein, a quality of wheat that's 8% protein uh, and relatively similar in the feed ration, uh, the characteristics in the feed ration to, to feed wheat. It's feed, fed one slightly lower test weight, but $100 a tonne difference in price, as I said before, wasn't sustainable. In the end, what we had was the international market fall away and domestic prices remain fairly firm. And this had to do with a few different things. The main thing was that the international, or the Southeast Asian market in particular, had uh, began to see very cheap offers of Australian feed wheat into the international market. And also... Um, and began to put up their hand. We saw the Philippines, South Korea, Indonesia all putting up their hand to, to buy Australian feed wheat given very strong prices for US corn and also for, um, <coughs> excuse me, also for uh, compared to Chicago feed wheat, Chicago futures. Just to illustrate there. I guess the point I'm trying to illustrate here is that there... We, we feel that, um, that if, if a grower can understand this relationship, uh, it, it can be, prove very handy. And if you look here, that the, the two options at, at the point in time of harvest was either to sell, or there were three options. You could either sell at, at harvest, or you could hedge, or you could also, um, you could also store your grain. Looking at the returns for a, pers for a grower who sold at harvest, they could receive a net return of 200, a bit over $200 a tonne. If they decided to hedge, sorry, I'm clicking through a bit quickly here, but if they decided to hedge and unwind the hedge when, when basis was at a more sustainable level, you could see that the net return there was, was higher and that, that was purely just through the understanding of, of fair value. Going into the outlook for this, this season, we've, it was good of Peter to touch on um, the issues of, of, I guess, a growing uh, population. And also another, another important point is growing middle class populations in both China and, and India. So some of the some of the situation or the key issues that we've got at the moment for the for the international market, which, as I said before, affects d domestic prices, is production shortfall for the U.S. hard red winter crop. We saw very good dry conditions there earlier, both uh, going into the winter dormancy period and also coming out of that period, particularly in Kansas. Sp spring wheat plant planting problems for both the U.S. in the north of the U.S. and also in, in the southern can Canadian states. The recovery of grain stocks in the Black Sea region after the devastating drought last year. Drought in Western Europe. Substitution uh, between the corn and wheat markets given a very strong corn market and also European debt concerns. Just quickly... I, I get quite excited about 
numbers, especially supply and demand numbers, and I realise some people probably don't share the same sort of excitement. <laughs> but I'll, um, I'll just quickly go through the key point here. We see production increasing this year by, or expected production increasing by 14 million tonnes. And at the same time, consumption really soaking up a lot of that extra production. Leaving, leaving stocks to use relatively unchanged. Stocks to use gives us an idea of the supply-demand relationship. And as you can see, the situation isn't really as tight as we had in 2008, 2000, 2007, 2008. But at the same time, we're also seeing a declining uh, level of stocks to use. Just touching on, on those key issues I was speaking about, the, the main issue for, for global supply of wheat is a lack of milling wheat or higher quality wheat. And that can be represented in, if you look at the spreads between the three major US futures markets. You've got Minneapolis, which is a 13.5% protein contract. Kansas, which is in the red, it's an 11.5% pro, uh, protein contract. And you've also got Chicago there at 8.5%. As you can see, the spreads have really widened. They've pretty much increased um, significantly over the past, or since November last year. And, and at the end there, there is a little bit of a, a fall in the level of, uh, in, in basis there. But that really has more to do with this slight bounce in Chicago prices over the past few weeks. Looking at, it's good to look at the US markets, but obviously uh, there's a lot of other major suppliers out there. I'd also wanted to point out to you the, that uh, US cash prices, you can see a similar sort of trend there with those. French milling wheat prices, 12% protein. These are all relative to the Chicago price. You can see basis strengthening, German milling wheat, and also Argentinian milling wheat. Given, given this information, prices globally, it seems to us that uh, milling grades are currently undervalued for, for new season. And... Um, I guess um, if you look here at the spreads between current prices and, and new season prices, you'll also see uh, very, very heavy... This is comparing uh, the current spreads to in the, in the domestic market for, for 2010 crop compared to 2011 crop. You can see that at the feed end, it's, it's not too bad, the spreads between current prices and new crop, but... The premiums really aren't there for H1, H2, and also APW above that Chicago market. Uh, so I, I guess the the, the take-home point with this is that, uh, as I said, we feel that under the current conditions, the global market is going to be looking for Australian milling wheat as we as we roll around to harvest as a supply supply sh to fill that supply gap. Uh, in Europe and also Western Europe and also out of the US hard red winter wheat belt and spring wheat planting areas. At the same time, we've also got global feed grain supply and demand, which is showing a pretty significant increase in production, but also, once again, consumption and lower carryover stocks due to the Russian situation really offsetting and actually decreasing stocks use for, for the feed grain market. As you can see, I, I thought I'd just point out that um, the relationship between wheat and coarse grains and or feed grains is going to play a very important role this year. And uh, you can see here that with wheat grain, uh, with the wheat market stocks to use, looking at the supply and demand figures for that, it doesn't paint an overly tight picture. But if you com combine that with the coarse grains, um, just going back here, 12.9% stocks to use, very tight feed grains stocks internationally, you can see when you add the two together and you recognise the substitutability between the two markets, it's actually a pretty tight market. 